How many blessed this morning? I don't need you blessed because you have what you want. But you're just blessed to still be here. Amen. You know, I look at the news sometimes when I'm getting dressed in the morning. And I just thank God that I'm still here. Amen. Because you see, tomorrow is not promised to anyone. But I thank God for what he has blessed me with thus far. Amen. And every day every ought to be day. precious. Amen. Every day Amen. ought to be a day that we thank God Amen. for allowing us, as our old folks used to say, allowing our days to roll on just a little bit longer. Amen. Open your Bible with me this morning, if you will, to the book of Exodus chapter 38. This morning we're going to continue our series on a holy approach to a holy God. And the purpose of this series, as I said before, is to teach us how to approach God. Teach us how to appreciate his holiness. I, I remember when Pastor and I was raising our son, over the course of their being raised, there were times that they disagreed with us. There were times when their opinion as to what should be done did not agree with our opinion as parents as to what should be done. And we told them this, you have the right to disagree, and you have the right to express your disagreement, but you better come right. Don't let your disagreement cause you to get out of character. Amen. God is saying to us this morning, he wants us to come before him. He's reaching out to us to come before him. But the only warning is, you better come right. In Exodus chapter 38, I'm going to read the scriptures first, then go back in and deal with them. And the hanging for the gate of the court was needlework of blue and purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen, and 20 cubits was the length, and the height in the breadth was five cubits, answerable to the hanging of the cord. And the pillars were four, and their sockets of brass four, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their chapters and the, their bands of silver, and all the pins of the tabernacle and of the quarter roundabout were of brass. I want to talk to you this morning in our next session, using as my topic the gate, the place of beginning. The place of beginning. Now we had said in previous weeks that when God first created man and woman, there were no barriers between God and man. Man had continuous, unbroken fellowship with God. Man obeyed God, obeyed him perfectly. And God was able to provide everything man needed, able to meet every need of man. But then it happened. Man sinned, disobeyed, and in essence rebelled against God. Man squandered the most important thing in the world, that being the care, the fellowship, and the guidance of a holy and righteous God. At that very moment, the door into God's holy presence slammed shut. Man was banned from entering into God's presence and was destined to be separated from God forever. But God had a plan of redemption. But God had a plan for man's redemption. It is a plan that would allow man to come back into his presence again. It was a plan that took years to fulfill. Nevertheless, God worked to carry out his plan through the centuries. One of the first stages of God's plan was revealing the construction of the tabernacle. Through the tabernacle, God allowed priests to stand in his presence 
for the people. But God's people were still far removed from experiencing the close, intimate presence of God. For they could not approach God personally. They had to approach God through a mediator. But the tabernacle was only a shadow of things to come. In God's perfect timing, he planned to send into the world one person who could open the door into God's presence. The one person who gives us access to God anytime, any place, anywhere, that person, Jesus Christ. Amen. The gate, the place of beginning. Visualize with me you standing on top of a mountain and you're looking out over the plains of Sinai and you see this strange tent in the middle of the desert and surrounding this tent thousands upon thousands of people. In fact, let me give you the exact location of the tribes as they're situated around the tabernacle. It was always God's desire to be in the midst of his people. It was always God's desire to be right where everybody had equal access to him. In fact, if you, if you notice, if you go back into early American history, you find out that the idea of a town square came from the method of the tabernacle. The church was always seated or located in the middle of time. But standing upon Mount Sinai and living over Sinai, this is what you would find. Standing on the top looking down, and just say we're looking, standing in the east looking toward the west. You will find immediately around the tabernacle three clans. And for those taking notes, I, I will try to be slow. I'm going to a very short message this morning. I'll try to be slow. You find three clans standing on the east, looking toward the west. Immediately to your right, which is the north, you find the Merorites. And behind them, you find three tribes. You find the tribe of Dan, who numbered 62,700 people, and behind them, you saw the tribe of Asher, which numbered 41,500 people. And finally, the tribe of Naphtali, who numbered 53,400 people. Now, each tribe had their own tribal standard or their own tribal banner, if you will. But they all flew under the symbol of the eagle. Keep in mind, eagle, north side. Behind the tabernacle, you find a clan called the Gershonites. And behind the Gershonites, you have the tribe of Ephraim, who numbered 40,500. Behind them, Manasseh, 32,200. Behind Manasseh, Benjamin, 35,400. And again, even though they all flew under their own tribal standard or banner, they come together and fly under the standard of the ox. Remember, you got an eagle, you got an ox. On the south side, immediately on the tabernacle, you had the Kohathites. Behind them, the tribe of Reuben, who numbered 46,500. Behind Reuben, Simeon, 59,300. Behind Simeon, Gad, 45,650. And as they had their own tribal standards, they all came together under the banner of the man. So you have the eagle, the ox, and the man. And immediately in front of you looking down, you would see right in front of the tabernacle, you would see Aaron and his sons, and you would see Moses. And behind them, you would see the tribe of Judah, 
numbering 74,600. Behind Judah, the tribe of Issachar, totaling 54,400. And behind Issachar, the tribe of Zebulun, numbering 57,400. And even though, again, they all had their own tribal standard, they flew into the banner of the lion. Now, now, this is important because you see these four figures again in the book of Ezekiel, where it talks about the four-faced beast that moves, that cannot return because they had a different face for each, each direction. And I imagine when they got ready to go this way, because the face is already facing that way, they just moved in that direction. There is no, with God, there is no shadow or turning. He can go whichever way he wants to any time because he is God. Now, what I just told you can be found in Numbers chapters 1 through 4 for your own convenience. But so you were to come down now from the mountain and proceed to the tabernacle. Now, I, I must tell y'all, if, if I tend to get excited, I really want to teach this morning, but I feel good. Amen, amen. James Brown ain't got nothing on me this morning. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> As you approach the tabernacle, the first thing that you would see would be this long white fence that encircled this little square or oblong box on the inside. This fence served two purposes. It served to keep people out and to keep those in, in. The Bible says the dimensions of it was eight feet tall. Now, I don't know if any is ready basketball players back in that time, so they were all like us, normal people. Eight feet would be beyond their reach. Amen. And because of the way the fence was situated, there was no way that you could go beneath it. But this fence spoke to us, as the psalm says, it was so high Can't get over. that you could not go over it. And it was so low, you could not get under it. So if you wanted to come into the tabernacle, you had to come in through one way. And that one way is called the gate. So then, the purpose of the fence was to prevent any unauthorized or wrongful approach to the tabernacle. The people understood that if they were caught trying to look under the fence, it meant certain death. Wow. To come in other than the front would make you a thief and a robber. Yeah. Again, liable for the penalty of death. Now, when I began to say this some time ago, I, I was amazed with the symbolism. We found out in my study that as you look at this linen fence, it measured exactly 1,500 cubits. It was 1,500 cubits. Cubits long. 1,500 being significant. Because I, I, in my study, I found out that from Adam all the way to Jesus, if you were to stand before this gate and walk around the defense line, you would walk for 1,500 feet and find yourself coming back right around here. I find that 1,500 was the number of years between Adam and Jesus. So if you begin, begin with Adam and took a trek down through history, it will bring you right back to the gate. Now, not only that, I found out that holding up this fence, holding up this fence rack, there were 60 sockets that supported pillars. And if you look, if you begin to walk around again, the, the, the fence line, and begin to look at each pillar, 
By the time you got back, it would bring you right back to Jesus. Because these 60 pillars represented the 60 men in Jesus' bloodline on Joseph's side. Now, these were not any ordinary pillars. They, they were called uh, 60 pillars of brass, meaning that they were wood. And wood represents humanity. And they were standing in silver sockets. Silver means redemption. That, that means you, you have people now, now humanity, wood, now covered in grass, having been judged for standing in silver. Meaning they didn't redeem. See, the, 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 those pillars are like a type of us, if you will. Because we all are of Adam's seed, we are all human. And we all have been judged. What the Bible tells us, we are born in sin yes. and shaven in iniquity. Yes. But thank God for the silver. Yes, Lord. I might have come here in wood, yes. overlaid in brass. Yes. But because of what Jesus did, yes. I now stand in silver redeemed. Yes. It's important, church, to see Amen. that nothing in this tabernacle is done by change. Yes. Yes. God did not tell Moses, to, okay, on that, you can do what you want to do. No, everything that was done had to be done by divine specification. God told Moses, Moses, do it according to the path that is in heaven. So Moses, I don't want you to add them. I don't want you to do your own thing. This is the blueprint. And this is what you are to follow. I also discovered that 1500 is significant because it is the approximate age during the period of the law. So again, if you took a walk around the fence line, it would bring you back to Jesus. So, when you came around the fence line and you found yourself standing at the fence, standing now at the gate, this gate spoke to us. And keep in mind, the gate always pointed toward the east. That means if I'm standing in front of the gate, the east will be behind me. Because remember, that is where the sun rose. Yes. You in. Amen. And our faith is based on the fact that one day the sun rose. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't mean the S-U-N, right? I mean the S-O-N. Yes. And because the S-O-N rose, Hallelujah. despite what we're going through right now, we can be victorious. Yes. Despite what's happening around us, we can be yes. victorious. Yes. Because as he rose, yes. we can rise. Because he got up, we can get up. But you got to start. You must start at the gate. It was to this gate that the psalmist wrote, "Enter into his gate with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise." He was letting them know that if you're going to come to God, you can't come to God with a long, droopy countenance. Amen. You can't come to God all depressed. Yes. You can't come to God with having a pity party. He says, you got to come before God and into his court. His gates of thanksgiving. Thankful for what? Yes. Thankful for what? Yes. But even though I know that I'm a sinner, yes. God has provided with me to go into his presence yes. and get my sin dealt with. So I'm going to go thankful. Yes. I, I know I'm none deserving. I know I'm a wretch undone. I know I don't deserve it. But because God has provided a way for me, yes. I'm going to enter in this court with thanksgiving. I'm going to thank him in advance. Yes. Thank you, Lord. That he's given me a chance. Glory. Into his courts with praise. I'm going to praise him right. Because even though I came here a sin, yes. I can leave with my sin cleansed. Yes, I can leave with my sin covered. I can leave with my sin atoned for. Yes. I don't have to go home the same way that I came. I thank God that when I come to church, I don't never have to go home the same way that I came. Because the God that I serve, he's able. Yes. He's able. He's able. But this gate 
the stacks that we talked about, they had a message. And the message was, keep out. But the message of the gates was for whosoever will. I like that. I, I like that. To whosoever will, let him come. Yeah. That means that even though I'm a sinner, he beckons me yeah. to come. Yes, Lord. Now, let me digress just for a second. And study the tabernacle, that there are two ways you can actually study the tabernacle. One is called the way of grace, which is mean it is from God's perspective looking out. But because we are human, because we are man, we will approach it from the perspective of faith. That is us coming toward God. So in the walk of faith, the gate is the first thing you got to deal with. In the walk of faith, you got to believe that he is a reward of them that diligently you got to believe. You got to have faith. Amen. Jesus said on one occasion, I am the door. Mm -hmm. So as you stood to this gate, we know looking back that this door represents now Jesus Christ. So because Jesus is the only one who can give me access unto God. I can't get to God unless I go through Jesus. He is represented by the gate. People will tell you there are other ways to get to him. But the scripture is clear. There is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we can be saved but the name of Jesus. So if you got a problem with Jesus, you can forget about seeing God. Yeah. Amen. How many of you could stand it if you had a visitor come to your house and sat down in your face and said, you know, brother, you know, I, I like you, but I can't stand your wife and your kid. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. Because you got to understand that, that my wife and my kids are a part of me. Amen. And if you can't stand them, it don't matter how you feel about me. So my first plan, my first idea rather, is why are you here? <laughs> if you can't stand a part of me. You got to understand. I'm not saying you got to love them, be crazy about them, but you're going to respect them. And especially in their own house. We must learn how to respect God in his house. And the reason we can't respect God in his house is because we don't do it in our house. There was a time when you go to folks' houses and every house, in every at least black family, they had two pictures or three pictures on their wall. They had Jesus, Martin Luther King, and JFK. And JFK. Those, were the, those were the three pictures, those were the trinity that people had in their home. But now, you, you, you go in people's homes, there's no picture of Jesus, there's no Bible on the coffee table. We have walked. There used to be a time when we respected the house of God. There was a time when I, when I was a, a, a shorty walking down the street with my friends. And we'd be using language that was rather salt. For y'all who don't know, we were cussing. But we respected the house of God enough that if we were walking down the street and we came by a church, we would stop until we got on the other side. And then we would resume. <laughs> and we were still sinning. But at least as kids, we had a respect. We had a reference for the house of God. Not for us in the church. Come on, preacher. And you wonder why there's no presence there. People do anything now in the church. And you wonder why 
God has no presence there. You people will do everything under the sun in the church. And you wonder why. Because the woman of the spirit came out. The tabernacle showed us how to get back to the basics. God says, I don't want you guessing on how to approach me. This is how I want to be approached. Any other way is unacceptable. This is one thing. It speaks to us of the way. This is the way. This is the approach unto God. There's no other gates outside the tabernacle. Every individual in Israel, if they wanted to approach God, had to come the same way. I, I like that. Because, you know, we have a tendency sometimes to want to slip in the back way. And I remember when I was a police officer and we go to certain events and whatnot and you go out front, there's a long line. And you go away, guard the back door, the side door. And you take out your badges and, and flash. flash the bag. Flash it. Come on. I'm thank, I thank God that there be no flashing <laughs> at the top of now. You flash at the top of it, okay. The door is that way. The gate is that way. You, you need to tell me my money won't let me in, no way, no, no. There's only one way to come in. Yeah, yeah. And that is through Jesus Christ. That is through the gate. Yeah. Someone once said, the, the, the ground at the cross is very level. That means every man starts out on the same foot. The same blood that was shed for me is also shed for you. Yeah. You may be the most worst of criminals. It took the same blood for you. Yeah. To say the person who in their own mind was not that bad. Yeah. Same blood. Same Jesus. Same cross. Same entity. Now, as we go through the tabernacle, we'll see that there's actually three different entrances. There's one on the outside called the gate. There's one that leads into the holy place called the door. And there's one inside the tabernacle proper called the veil. And we'll deal with those as we get them. Right now, we're dealing with the gate. Somebody say the gate. The gate. And that brings us to our scripture. Verse number 18. And the hanging, meaning the covering of the entrance, called the gate of the court. Now, later on, this court was later called the court of the Gentiles. Because during Solomon's time and Herod's time, their temple allowed Gentiles to come in for the purposes of expecting business, conducting business and whatnot. But at this point, only those of the tribe of Israel were allowed to come into the tabernacle. And even then, they could only go so far. One thing that I, that I found particularly interesting was, I know that the closer you got to God in the tabernacle, the more respected it became. I mean, think about this. At, at the gate, the whole nation could come in. But when you got to the holy place, only the priest could come in. But when it came to the holy of holies, only one man could go behind the veil. Yeah. One man, one time a year. So the closer you got to God, the more restricted it came to his presence. In verse 18, and the hanging for the gate of the court was a needlework. This Needlework is called damask. It's, it's, it's a process of embroidery, and it's called damask. It became really, really popular in the city of Damascus, but it's called damask. It says of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen. Now, these are all linens, blue linen, scarlet linen, purple linen, and white linen. And as you stood to the gate, you saw different patterns of this, colors. And each color represented something. And when I saw this, I, I was moved by the fact that I saw four things in relation to this gate. The first thing I saw, number one, that this was the only entrance to the court. That's important. For those who will tell you that there are different ways to get to God. Don't you believe it? For those who would tell you that different religions and denominations got their own approach, there's only one way, and that is through Jesus. 
You can't approach Buddha and end up with God. You can't pray. You can't approach Muhammad and expect to end up with God. You got to come through Jesus. Amen. If you have any hope or aspirations of ever making it to God. So again, there was only one interest to this court. Jesus would later say again, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh to the Father unless he come by or through me. This tells us again that there is only one way, one Savior, and one mediator between God. So number one, it was the only interest. Number two, it was a wide gate. It was wide enough to accommodate everyone that wanted to come. There was no need for pushing and shoving. There was room for everyone to come. And as the song says, there is room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there is still room for one. There is room, room, room. There is room at the cross for you. I feel like that. That's what I was going to do. Thank you, Jesus. It was the only interest. It was a wide gate. And number three, it was a beautiful gate. It was enrolled or embroidered with several colors that made it something that attracted those searching for something beautiful. Keep in mind, as I said, if you go around the fence line, it's all white. It's all white. But when you stood at the gate, it was a different color. It had the blue, the purple, the scarlet, and the white. And whereas different diagrams may show you different patterns, each pattern would show you that those colors were entwined in. Remember we said the blue pointed to Christ as the heavenly one. And he's depicted that way in the Gospel of St. John. The purple saw showed us that he was the royal one to whom Matthew testified. The scarlet points to the blood as the one who was sacrificed for our sins, as we find in the book of Mark. The fine white linen, symbolizing purity and righteousness, was also in this gate as depicted by Luke. So we saw in this day that heaven's royal blood purchased our purity. To come to the gate was the only way to God. For the gate symbolized the gospel which alone pointed the way to Jesus. And fourthly, this was a distinctive gate. No one seeing the gate could mistake it for the rest of the wall. You knew when you had come to the gate. If you look around here, you see red, and then you see black on both sides. So there's no mistaking the light blue for the black or the red. You knew when you came to blue. And in the same way, in the tabernacle, you knew when you had arrived at the gate because the colors were different. And it says that the pillars were full. And their sockets of brass full. Their hooks of silver and the overlaying of their chapters. Chapters is another, another name for the caps that sat on top. And they were silver. It's important to have a, a, a silver cap chopper. Because that means that not only is my body redeemed, but my mind is redeemed. It, it makes no, no sense in the world for me to be sitting in the church if my mind is not here. But it's pointed to the fact that this person was totally redeemed. Silver on top, silver on the bottom, symbolizing redeemed from head to toe. I wonder what would happen if we had more redeemed folk in the church who were truly saved from the head to the toe. I wonder how different we would be if we had more redeemed people in the church that were saved, really saved, genuinely saved. From the head of the 
And just as these pillars in the tabernacle were to stand upright, holding up the things, read to this, the New Testament believer priests are called to hold up the righteous standard of our God. Now, along the top of the fence, there was something called pillars, and they also were silver. Pillars were nothing more than called connecting rods, what they would call a curtain rod. And it was upon the silver fillets that the curtain, the fence, and the wall came. Silver again being redemption. Redeemed men reaching out to each other, holding up the righteous standard of God. This morning, church, it is my desire to show you the game. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna be right, you gotta start right. If you're going to walk right, you gotta start right. If you're living in Miami and you have plans of going to New York, you cannot start out going south. I don't care how good your intentions may be. But if you start out going in the wrong direction, you need to start out right. You got to start out right. And if we are going to approach God, and it is my desire that through this series of teaching that we really learn what it means to approach a holy God, and then learn how to approach a holy God. It will transform not only us, not only this church, but this community. I long to see the day that people put into the parking lot. And because we are here, they get out of their car in the presence of an almighty God. Amen. When what's on the inside begins to overflow on the outside. I long to see the day when people step out the car and start falling in the parking lot because the power of God is just that strong. But it cannot be that way if what's happening in the house is not pleasing unto God. Amen. So it is time for the church to be what God has called us to be. That's that call out one. Not to make us better, but to make us different. Amen. As I said last week, God on no occasion told us to be better than anybody else. But he did say we ought to be different. Yeah. And the difference is at some point in time in our life, we get it down and bow our knees and say, God, forgive me for all the sin that I have committed. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. Teach me how to walk upright before you and before my fellow man. Teach me how to approach you the way you want to be approached. Teach me how to do it your way. Everybody got their own way. But God, it is your way to count. Everybody got their own method. But God, it's your way. I can't tell you how many seminars I've attended that tell you how to do this in the church and how to do that in the church. People who, who, who are pastor of mega churches with thousands and thousands and thousands of people are now getting rich telling other churches how they did it. So let me be fine and good for you. But give me the Bible. Amen. Because the Bible tells us that if we do it this way, after all, this is supposed to be his house. And if anybody ought to have a say in this house, it ought to be him. And if he has told us what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what's the problem? The problem is because we have been so socialized that we have been sold a bill of goods that says it don't take all of that. I, I, I love God as much as you, but it don't take all of that. You get all sweaty. You get all loud. Trust me. If I could sweat more, I sweat more. Amen. If I could get louder, I would get louder. Because even the best that I can give him, 
is still not good enough. Amen. The very best that I have to offer is still not good enough. But guess what? The good news is, if it's given from my heart, yeah. and it's given, it's given the way that he's falling to bring, yeah. he will accept it. Amen. That's why I can enter into his gates yeah. with thanksgiving. Because yeah. I know I don't have a right to even be there. But because you told me if I do it this way, you will receive me. Yeah. You will accept me. Yeah. And based on that fact, knowing that when I leave, I don't leave the way I got there. Amen. You see, I may have arrived there hurting. I may have arrived there depressed. I may have arrived there discouraged about something. But when I get in the presence of God and I wait my problem alongside of my God, what can my God handle? You see, the problem that we have is we look at our problem instead of our God. And anytime you focus on the problem, you will always be discouraged. But you take that same problem and you stand alongside of a holy and righteous God and you see just how big your problem really is alongside of a God that is awesome. Alongside of a God that is able. Alongside of a God that can do anything but fail and lie. Alongside of that kind of God. This morning, the Lord woke me up about one o'clock in the morning. I was back in my sleep. And I was on my knees most of the time. About three this morning, thank God, teach us. Teach us. Not, not just to get book smart, but book smart don't mean nothing. God is not impressed with book smart. Amen. But teach us what it means to, to walk into your presence unafraid. How long to see the day when we can truthfully come into his presence with boldness. Not arrogance, but boldness. Because we know that I've been redeemed. Because yeah. I got silver on my feet. Yeah. Silver on my head. Yeah. I have been redeemed. Yeah. There's something to say about being redeemed. Kenneth Cooper sang a song years ago. And the song said, Only the redeemed shall hear his voice on that day. When he comes in clouds of glory to take us all the way. He said, the clouds will then burst open. And the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up into the sky. I'm longing for the day, church. I got my bags packed and I stay ready. Because we don't know when that day may come. But one thing we do know, it is coming. We don't know the hour, nor the day, nor the year. But one thing we do know is that based on the word of God, that our day will surely come. The appointed hour may peace. Yeah. Now I must stand before my judge and pass that solemn test. Now, I pray this morning. It's the Lord, it's the Lord bring us all to the gate and show us the magnificence of the gate. Show us what it means to really stand at the gate. Because you see, we have people all over the world coming to the gate, but they never proceed inside. You haven't come to church until you have ventured inside. You see, you have people come to church all the time and, and, and hang out in the parking lot. You ain't been to church. You, you've been to the parking lot. Amen. Well, technically, the parking lot is part of the church. Well, that may be, but there's no glory Amen. in the parking lot. You need to go where the glory is. And as we see, as we proceed through the time, the closer you get to God, the more he requires for you to take off. You see, you may come into his office dirty, filthy, and nasty. And you know what? He'll receive you. Yeah. But the closer you get to him, he'll say, okay now. That's as far as you can go in that condition. Yeah. If you want to come any closer, you got to take off yeah. whatever. Yeah. You know, I, I thank God that he, he won't let me come 
any kind of way because he loves me enough to tell me when I'm wrong. He loves me enough to tell me when I'm headed in the wrong direction. If you don't care about somebody, you don't care how they look. If you don't care where they go. You don't care what they do. But when somebody is always on your case, trying to get you to do right, trying to get you to straighten up, trying to get you to go the same now, it's because they love you and care about you. Well, this word of God is, is, is proof positive of how much he loves us Amen. and how much he loves his people Israel. Because the entire book of Leviticus is a bunch of do's and don'ts. And he gave it to those who will become Abraham's seed. And the Bible says, if we are part of the church today, then we are Abraham's seed. Because Abraham's seed was Jesus. And if we are in him and he's in us, then we are partakers of the promise. So, Pastor, what do I do when my promise is hidden behind a promise? I know what God has told me to do. I can see it. But between me and the promise, there's a problem. So that, how do I get around the problem to receive a promise? You persevere. You persevere. You don't give up. You don't throw in the towel. You hang in there. But you know God is looking for you. To come close. And the closer you get to it, the further away it gets. Because if God has given you a word of assurance, if God has given you a promise, then you start walking toward that promise. I don't care how many problems may present themselves, because the closer you get to the promise, if you're doing what God can do, that problem better start backing up. Amen. It'll start backing up. Why? Because you are being obedient to what God has called you, chosen you, elected or selected you to do. And because he has chosen you and because he has sent you, he is responsible for you. I like that part. See, I didn't call myself for this. Trust me. If I had to call myself to do this, I would have uncalled myself years ago. And to be honest, that happened time. I said, wait a minute. Let me go back and make sure that what I heard was, Captain, am I lying? I, I, I wonder if, if, if it's worth it. And then when you have friends around you, pastor or friends around you that say, you know, that's God. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm giving up, I'm giving up. Like, it don't seem worth it. Nobody wants to hear a holy no more. Everybody wants to hear a right. You're not being right. I'm saying, well, wait a minute. If he can just, just give up, maybe it won't be so bad. I, I, I'll be in good company. <laughs> At least they won't be able to say, he by himself gave up. I mean, I'll be with others. But just when, just when, I think the decision has been made. Yeah. No more room for discussion. He speaks to you. Yeah. And he tells you, you come too far. Yes, Lord. To give up now. You, you, I, God, I got too much invested in you for you to give up now. Just hang on a little while longer. Amen. And I come to tell somebody this morning who may be ready to throw in the towel. Who may be ready to quit? Who may be ready not to come to church no more? I'm going to tell you what God told me. Stay in a little while longer. It'll be worth it. After a while. Amen. After a while, all of your time, all of your laboring will pay off. All of your long days, weary nights, it'll pay off. All of your getting talked about, being rebuked and sworn by those who claim they will love you, it will pay off. Yeah. And I close with this. Why here on earth, a Christian's pay may not be that good. 
but the retirement benefits of how this works. Give me a in the prayer.